Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast. My name is Dr. Brian Reed. I'm a naturopathic doctor, and I am joined today by a fellow naturopathic doctor, Dr. Erin Kinney. Uh, Dr. Kinney practices in Maryland, and I'm excited to pick her brain about a bunch of the topics that I've seen on her social media posts. I've been following her for a little while. She is a smart cookie. At least that's the impression she gives online. I think we'll probably see that's the case when we chat and, uh, and directly here. Um, so Dr. Kenny, thanks so much for joining me today. And uh, would you be able to just give us a quick rundown in terms of uh, what your practice is about and um, how you got involved working with folks with complex chronic illness? Sure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be on the show. So yeah, I'm a naturopathic doctor. It's great to chat with other NDs. And I, I'm going to start with how I got into the medicine. I am um, in my early twenties. I went from running marathons. I mean, this happy, healthy 20 something to, I couldn't get out of bed. I gained weight. My joints hurt. I was crying all the time. Um, and I went to my GP and he was like, Oh, you must be depressed. And, you know, handed me a prescription for an antidepressant. And I was like, wait a second, this doesn't quite seem right at the time. I'd, as I said, I was running marathons. I'd been, I'd become a vegan for several years. And I just was like, it felt like something was off in my body. Something felt very wrong in my physical body. So I was in therapy at the time. My therapist referred me to a naturopathic doctor who I'd, I'd never heard of. And I went and saw him and he spent two hours with me and ran a whole bunch of interesting lab work. And turns out all my nutrient levels were low. My neurotransmitters were completely out of whack and my adrenals were basically in the tank. Um, you know, it's funny and we might get into this later when we talk about complex stuff. Basically, he treated me for adrenal fatigue and I felt amazing after about eight weeks. My joints stopped hurting. My energy came back. I started to lose weight. I felt more like myself. I do actually think now, knowing what I know now, I probably was exposed to mold back then. And so there was probably some of that going on that had caused my adrenals to crash. Anyways, so I ended up then deciding at some point that I wanted to go back to, nat to school to become a naturopathic doctor. And I really wanted to help women just like me who were told, hey, here's an antidepressant. There's really nothing wrong with you. You're probably just depressed. And so that's kind of what I do in my practice now. I treat men and women um, and they come in usually just not feeling like themselves. They feel off, they're irritable, they're not sleeping. Um, maybe they've gained weight, they might have joint pain, they might have muscle aches, they're fatigued, headaches, but they go to their regular doctor, they get labs done and their doctor's like, you're fine, your CBC and your chem panel are totally normal, it must be in your head, here's an antidepressant. Or for women, oh, your hormones are out of balance, here's the birth control pill, we can fix that right up. And my patients come in and they're like, I feel like my doctor didn't listen to me. Something is wrong. They didn't run the right test. They just, and they don't feel good and they want to feel better. So that's really the patient population that I end up treating. I, I kind of got into, I really like hormones. I like thyroid health. I like, um, I like treating, you know, estrogen, progesterone imbalances. And over my years in practice, I started to realize that something always causes hormones to be out of balance. They don't just randomly go out of balance. And I would say in my practice, probably the majority of my patients that I end up treating that come in with hormonal imbalance symptoms end up having some sort of underlying thing like Lyme disease or chronic Epstein-Barr or mold exposure. And it's, you know, those things are diverting their, you know, their nervous system's energy. The body is like, I'm going to try to take care of that. And basically the body doesn't have enough energy to build the sex hormones and keep those in balance. So that's kind of how I ended up treating patients in that, in that realm. Um, you know, and I didn't, it's funny, I didn't actually intend to, to treat, to treat that kind of stuff. I'm like, how did I get up? How did I end up treating Lyme disease all the time? But I diagnosed Lyme probably at least eight to 10 times a week. It, it's, and I feel like it's just so prevalent and in patients that I wouldn't have expected that they had Lyme, you know, they come in and their periods are out of whack. They're irritable. They're not sleeping. They have headaches, which sounds very much like basic hormonal balance. But when we kind of figure out what the underlying issue is, you know, we find out they've got Lyme disease. And oftentimes I find when we treat it, you know, depending on where they are in, you know, their Lyme journey, they, their hormones go back into balance and they feel better. Imagine that you treat the root yeah. cause and it gets, gets better. They get better. Yeah. And, and, um, I think you raised just a really important point. Cause as, as you were saying, you've seen this, I've seen in my practice too. I'm sure many of us in the functional, uh, medical world see this as well, that, uh, folks will come in saying like, Oh, like it's a hormone thing to like, say, yeah, probably is. But like, what's upstream to that, you know, like it's, yeah. um, I've like to talk about the concept of like, what's the root cause of the root cause and what's the root cause yeah. of that root cause. And you can kind of really go down the rabbit yeah. hole, but sometimes you need to, uh, what type of testing are you generally using to pick up Lyme in your patients, if you don't mind sharing? Um, so I usually start, I, I do all, this first line of testing that I do is I test through LabCorp. So I do a Western blot, and then I also test some other markers. I look at C3A, C4A, CD57 markers, trans growth factor beta, and some some other like moldy markers. Um, if we get something that's kind of ambiguous and I'm like, oh, I'm not quite sure, I might run an hygienics test. Um 
And, but oftentimes I feel like, cause here's my thought on functional testing. It can get really expensive, right? So if, you know, if someone comes back with two or three line bands, they have all the symptoms, their CD57 numbers are low and their C4A is out of control. I usually am going to diagnose someone <laughs> like, I think you have Lyme. And sometimes I'll do a little bit of a Lyme challenge before we do any like full Lyme treatment. I'll do a little bit of like either a homeopathic challenge or a little bit of an immune boosting thing. And I see how they tolerate it. If they get some sort of like herxing reaction, I'm like, okay, I think we're onto something. That being said, you know, the hygienics test is a lot more specific. And if, if someone is willing and, you know, okay to spend that money, I'm happy to, happy to, you know, run that for them. Um, but I find, you know, especially when you're dealing with this kind of stuff, it can get expensive. The treatment protocols get expensive. The visits get expensive. And if we can diagnose without the expensive test, sometimes that can be, can help, you know, save someone or help them allocate those resources, you know, towards something that actually gets them better. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's like you spend the bucket load of money on testing. It's like, and now we just start the treatment. It's like, oh man, like that's. Well, and yeah. And, and, it's, you know, and, I, and, and again, some patients really like to see, like, I want the definitive answer, but I oftentimes with a good, with a really good history and, you know, lab core, you know, Western blot and granted, sometimes you can have, there are so many false negatives on Western blots and that's a whole other issue. But um, if, you know, if I'm like 95% sure they have Lyme and they have one or two bands on the Western blot, I'm going to go ahead and treat them because, you, and usually they're going to feel better. Mm -hmm. um, on on that note, uh, you mentioned uh, something about a homeopathic challenge. And do you mind just speaking to what that involves? Uh, give or oh, and actually, sorry, just before you answer that question, um, uh, as per usual, folks uh, listening, uh, we're um, not providing any health advice on this podcast. This is for informational purposes only. If you need any health advice or medical advice, please talk to your healthcare provider to get that advice. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry, but the uh, homeopathic challenge, could you speak to that, please? Yeah, sure. And thank you for noting that. I, I, so I have a podcast as well called the Dr. Kinney show. And I, I harp every episode. I'm like, it's so important that you have, if you're dealing with any sort of chronic complex thing, make sure you have a provider that you trust that you, and that you're running all this stuff by, just as you said, because there's a lot of information out there and it's very easy to get lost in the information and be like, Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this, but it's really good to have someone helping you through this journey. Cause it can be confusing. Um, so I like to use Lyme nosodes. Um, and a nosode is basically a homeopathic version of something. So of, of a, of a disease or, um, uh, what's the word of an, uh, bacteria. So it's basically, they take the Lyme bacteria and they dilute it multiple times. And so when you, it's almost a little bit like the concept of a vaccine. So you give the body a little bit of, and we see how the body responds. Um, I use a lot of um, complex homeopathics in my practice, um, which a complex homeopathic is a homeopathic that has multiple different remedies in there versus a constitutional homeopathic, which would be one. I, I like them. They're very gentle. Um, they are extremely effective, but they tend to not cause as many like strong Herx reactions, but we can get a little bit of a worsening, which again is usually like, oh, yep, there might be something going on there. So for example, if I give someone that let's say they had one or two line bands come back positive, their CD57 numbers were a little bit low. They have, you know, a few symptoms that are like, eh, there might be something going on. I might give them a Lyme nosode and I'll tell them, hey, what we're looking for is if you start to have an increase in body aches or joint pain or headaches or and just feel blah, if you get a little bit worse, that usually is an indication that we've triggered the immune system to go look and start fighting Lyme. And most people feel crappy when they're fighting a disease like that because the immune system is now going to, you know, divert all of its attention into that battle. And we're not going to have as much energy to, you know, do other things like make sex hormones or give you energy or those kinds of things. So, um, so again, we kind of look for that. And if, and if we do see that, then we can go with a full Lyme protocol. And with the Lyme nosos, just out of curiosity, are you kind of giving like a single potency or are you doing like an escalating potency? Usually it's, uh, I usually do a, a comp, like a, it's a, mm, I use a different, a couple different protocols, but usually there are multiple different potencies in one. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I, there's a lot of different ways. And I, I, maybe this is a good thing to say, if you're listening, there are so many ways to approach treating this, diagnosing this. And again, I think what you have to do, if you're thinking that you're struggling with this is find somebody that you want to work with and that you trust. And, and sometimes there may be several different things you have to try. Um, what I love about naturopathic medicine is we have a lot of different tools available and we might say, Hey, we're going to try this protocol and uh, it doesn't really work. Maybe let's try this when we have this other toolbox or toolkit in our toolbox. Um, you know, in, the, in conventional medicine, if you get a full CDC positive, you know, test on a Western blot, they're going to give you antibiotics, which sometimes can be helpful if you've just recently contracted and it's right in that initial phase and you have your body knows it's there and it knows where it is. I find that, you know, a course of doxy can be super effective to start. There can usually there's usually a, a follow up protocol after that. Um. <clears throat> 
and in, just in terms of treatment options that you work with. And as you mentioned, like there's yeah, many different ways to, to go at it. Um, but uh, what are some of the, like if you say do your um, nozo challenge, uh, you know, there's confirmatory labs or highly suggested labs, like, okay, we're going to pull out all the stops here. Let's, you know, treat this person for Lyme or co-infections or what have you. Uh, what type of tools would you typically um, default to in your practice? So I really like botanical medicine, you know, using like botanical kind of killing herbs. I use a lot of herbs that will also boost the immune system. I like to think about it like this, it's, you know, it's, it's, we've got, you've got to make sure your immune system has fighting capability. And we also want to make sure we're helping the immune system kill off things. So we can use certain herbs. It's, the reason botanical medicine is so cool is because some herbs contain both of these qualities. We want herbs that are going to boost your natural killer cells. So your T cells, we also want herbs that are going to actually kill the Lyme. Um, and then sometimes we want things that are going to like pull the Lyme out. And then I use a lot of enzymes like serapeptase and we use some, um, sometimes we'll use like charcoal or, um, fulvic acid or things to kind of help any die off symptoms. Um, and I, I really like Corella as well. I find that helps people feel better while they're undergoing this. I'm trying to think of what else I use. It honestly, everybody's a little bit different. And, you know, sometimes again, we'll, we'll start a protocol. We see how they do. If they don't do so well, then we might tweak it a little bit um, so we can find kind of the right, the right thing to move forward. Um, there's also, I don't do this in my office, but um, there's a doc in Maryland that I refer to often that will do IV, you know, IV therapy. I refer out usually for high dose vitamin C IVs, which I find is really, really effective for Herx reactions. It also kills just about everything. So oftentimes that's, I recommend that if someone's got Lyme and also like a high viral titer. So if they're EBV or their CMV or their HHG um, HSV six levels are high, that high dose vitamin C can really go in and help the immune system kill the viral stuff. Um, and it also boosts the immune system as well. Great. And, uh, what are some of your favorite botanicals in the, the killing sphere? Oh, you're going to ask me all these questions. Huh? <laughs> you, you <can laughs> I'm really bad at remembering herbs and dates. What'd you say? You can plead the fifth on any of it. That's um, the, I like andrographic. I use andrographis. I use a lot of mushrooms. I love, I love mushrooms because they also, you know, again, a lot of my patients are also kind of suffering from adrenal fatigue and hormones, you know, imbalances and mushrooms are really nice. They're a nice adaptogen as well as having the properties of boosting CD 57 or, or, um, the, uh, the T cells, um, and I'm trying to think what else I use a lot of, I use a lot of blends. So, so you, I'm going to have to see if I can remember what's, what's in them. Um, mm, yep. I'm going to plead the fifth on this. That's okay. We can... Talk to your doctor about which potential. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. It's I good. got a lot of stuff in my head. It's hard to keep track of all the things. I hear you. Yeah. When you're in that uh, flow state where it's like, oh yeah, like just rhyme it off. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, no worries. Um, so um, we, we um, you'd mentioned uh, about mold as, as possibly being something that uh, could be a trigger for folks as well. Um, as far as if say, you know, patient comes in, they have a say history of mold exposure. Um, let's just say in this example, they're, they're out of the moldy environment uh, now. So that's kind of been taken care of, um, but they're still suffering from the symptoms of mold illness, mold toxicity. Um, what are some of the treatments that you would kind of default to uh, or tend to gravitate towards to help them uh, recover from yeah. that mold illness once their exposure has been addressed? Yeah. So, I mean, with mold, you know, mold's going to, particularly if it's bad mold, they're going to have mycotoxin levels in their body, which are these toxins that the mold spits out and they tend to get trapped in the tissue. So I, I start by making sure their lymphatic and all of their routes of detoxification are working properly. So if you have to be pooping, you have to be peeing, you have to be sweating. So if those aren't happening, we got to get that happening first. Cause if we start to detox you and you there's nowhere for it to go. We're going to have a problem. So um, I recommend lymphatic massage. I start to do like a homeopathic lymphatic drainage protocol. We again, make sure the bowels are moving. And for some people that could be, you know, we use magnesium or we use something else to stimulate stuff. Other people, we need to address whatever underlying issue, you know, might be causing the bowels not to be moving like a thyroid thing or so bowels moving. We need to make sure they're urinating, which usually includes drinking tons of water to make sure that the kidneys are able to move things through. And then I, I recommend saunas or doing something that helps you start sweating. And I find a lot of my patients with, um, mold toxins, they don't sweat very much. Like they'll, they'll be like, I don't sweat. So we have to get them sweating. And sometimes the trick I've kind of found to get people sweating is to start increasing electric like consumption and 
way more salt than you think you need. So a ton of salt, a ton of magnesium, a um, ton of potassium, because that usually will help the body have the capability to sweat. And sweating is one of the best ways to kind of, again, get the, the detox routes open. Um, so we make sure that's working. And, and then we use some sort of binder. I really like fulvic acid and humic acid. Um, sometimes we'll use activated charcoal. So those things will go and will bind and attach to the mycotoxins. And then again, we want to make sure that the body's able to flush them out. Um, I use some NAC um, which is really helpful for the liver. I will also recommend IVs for them. I'm um, getting glutathione and sometimes NAD if they've got a lot of brain fog going on, because that can be really common with mold illness. Um, and, oh, and I use high doses of Corella. I love Corella. It's amazing. I really like energy bits. Shout out to energy bits. They're a great company. Um, Catherine Armstrong started it. She's a friend and they're really great. They're little tablets. You can chew them or swallow them and it's easy to get the dosing in there. So you have to take really high doses, usually several times a day to kind of help with the, with the mold detox. Um, and it can take a while. That's the thing that some people are like, Oh, I did it for two weeks. I'm like, no, no, you're probably going to need to take this for four to six months, depending on how long your mold exposure was. And I think this is one of the things that I find is sometimes it's frustrating when people are kind of coming to see a doctor. They want to feel better right away. And everyone wants, we always, we all want the quick fix. We want to feel better right away, but these things that we're talking about, it can take a while to have the body heal. And you might have, you know, I was, I have this meme that I post all the time on the internet. It's, it's the healing journey is not linear. You know, you might go up a little bit, you might come back, you might go up a little bit, you might come back and it's, and that's normal. You might take three steps forward and two steps back and then three steps forward and one step back. But as long as, as long as we're still progressing, that's good. And this is again, where it's really helpful to have a practitioner walking you through this journey because they can reflect back to you hey, the last time you were here, you said this, you're not saying that anymore. Because sometimes I'll get patients that come in after like their six week follow-up and they're like, yeah, I don't feel any different. And I'm like, okay, let's let's talk about that. And I'll be like, well, last time you said this. And they're like, oh yeah, that's right. I'm not getting those headaches that last five hours anymore. They only last 30 minutes. And, or like, okay, right. I'm going to bed a little bit early and I'm waking up a little bit more energy. But because sometimes when you're too close to it and you, you're with yourself all the time, you might not really realize that you have improved, especially if they're really subtle improvements. So again, it can be really helpful to have someone reflect back to you, you know, Hey, you are improving. Um, and that can be, cause it can, it can be struggling if you're doing all these things and taking all these protocols and, you know, spending all this money and you're like, I really don't feel like I'm getting better. So it's nice again, to have that, like that reminder or that, um, reassurance that you are actually improving. Yeah, a hundred percent. And yeah, I, I smile while you're saying that because I've, I've been there as well. And, uh, and, yeah. and sometimes, you know, in all fairness, you know, you, you sort of go back through and say, oh, like you, you know, this is how you rated your headaches last time and this and that. And like nothing has changed. So that does happen. And it's like, really yeah, well, and that's normal too. Through. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and sometimes it's like, yeah, things have actually objectively changed. But yeah, if you're too close to it, it's hard to, hard to see it sometimes. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to ask you a couple of like kind of rapid fire questions here, sure. um, Aaron, uh, if you don't mind, uh, or, or Dr. Kinney, Aaron, Dr. Kinney, you know, we've known each other for like half an hour now. I feel like we're yeah. on a first name basis. We're I friends. Hope. We're all friends. Yes. Uh, there we go. There we go. Um, so uh, if could you uh, name your top um, uh, one or two or three, whatever you're in the mood for um, favorite uh, functional lab tests. So like say non-standard, like non-lab. Got it. Test. Um, I like the one day stool Genovas. I think it's the GI effects protocol or uh, GI effects test. Um, I really like that for complicated GI stuff that we can't get a handle on. I like the Dutch test for hormone stuff because it looks at hormones, but it also looks at your detox pathways. And that really helps me understand how the body's getting rid of hormones. And I like real-time labs, mycotoxin test, because that gives us like a real, you know, because sometimes it can be really hard to test your house for mold. Sorry, I'm going to talk more. Did you want me to keep it? <laughs> No, 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 it's okay. Yes, sir. Because I, um, I, I get patients that are like, oh, my house was tested for mold. It came back negative. And I'm like looking at them. I'm like, I'm like positive. I'm like, it's sound, you've got all the mold exposure symptoms. Your mold markers on your lab tests are high. Um, and so if you run that mycotoxin test, we can get some real answers like, oh, well, clearly you there's something in your house or something somewhere that you're exposed to that you have that. So I like that one. Awesome. Those are all good ones. Um, just out of curiosity, like, um, how do you, um, conceptualize or how do you like, yeah, think about it in your own mind or explain it to patients. So they're like, Oh, well, you know, I had my, you know, testosterone and estrogen and DHEA and progesterone and everything tested, like just through say, you know, standard lab, like, you know, just serum results. Um, and then, you know, my Dutch tests, like, why would I get a Dutch test done? Like what, what are the advantages? Uh, I, I know you mentioned about the metabolism, but uh, of the hormones, but, um, are there any other advantages to the Dutch test beyond seeing, you know, how are, so, how are the well, the Dutch test will look at it's, it's more comp comprehensive. I mean, and I, I, granted, I, like I said, I use, I will test serum levels of hormone as my kind of starting point with people. And sometimes I can see like, okay, we've got an estrogen progesterone ratio here issue, but the Dutch test will test all of your different types of estrogen. It will type the different breakdown process. So it's, it's really helpful for me 
in order because we can be like okay your estrogen's a little bit high your progesterone's a little bit low your testosterone's a little bit low your dha is a little bit low your cortisol's a little bit low and i can treat that based on symptoms but sometimes it's a little more helpful to be like hey your two precursor hormones to this are also low or this precursor is really high but this one's low which will tell me that we're not converting very well so it's helpful for me to figure out like which cofactors we're missing or um you know kind of what we need to do treatment wise and I will usually recommend the Dutch test if I've tried some other protocols and they haven't worked. Then I'm like, okay, maybe we might want to try the Dutch test. Um, that being said, sometimes people come in and they're like, I want to do the Dutch test. I'm like, great, it's, it's a great test. And it's urine, you don't have to get a blood draw. So I've sometimes had patients that hate needles and they're like, I don't want to run, I don't want to go get the 15 tubes of blood you normally order. So I'm like, okay, we'll do some urine tests because it's a little bit easier. Yes, yeah, definitely more, yeah, fan favorite to not have to get all those yes. tubes of blood drawn for sure. Yes. Um, if you, um, so if there are some hormonal imbalances, and I realize this is a very broad question, so uh, mm -hmm. maybe you can just, um, yeah, uh, w whatever answer you want to give for this. Um, but could you give an example or a few examples of some of the tools that you might use if you do see some hormonal imbalances? Like, let's say, let's say not on a Dutch test, let's say like you're just running standard blood labs and you see, um, you know, it looks like there's, you know, symptom picture of say estrogen dominance um, and labs are kind of helping to corroborate that. Um, like, could you give an example of some of the tools that you might reach for to help balance that? Yeah. So if there's a clearance problem of any hormone, we're usually going to be looking at phase two detoxification in the liver. So kind of what I said earlier about the mold detox, we want to make sure that all the routes of elimination are open. So you've got to be pooping, you've got to be peeing, you've got to be sweating. So those three things are super important. So if those three things aren't happening, I'm not going to do anything else fancy. We're going to focus on that. And I find most patients with estrogen dominance, they're constipated. They're not sweating. They may not be drinking enough water, like stuff's not, you know, their, their body's not clearing. If that's going, or once we get that going, then I like to use dim. Um, sometimes we will milk, milk thistle. I can, I sometimes will put people on a little bit of like a liver detox. We'll, we'll look at diet. And if diet is, you know, if they're not eating a lot of cruciferous veggies or they're not eating veggies in general, and, you know, diet is containing a lot of, um, if they're eating a lot of things that contain estrogen. So if they're buying meats that aren't hormone free, or if they're eating a lot of dairy, that's not hormone free, that could be contributing to estrogen levels being high. So, so we kind of want to look at it from two aspects. We want to make sure the liver is able to break it down. And then we also want to look for, again, the root cause of the root cause. We want to look for like, why is that estrogen so high? Like, are we getting exposed to it somewhere? Um, and usually it's a combination of both. Usually there's some sort of exposure and the body's not detoxing it. Um, I had a case recently of a woman who'd been on the birth control pill for a while and I don't often see this, but her estrogen was like, she'd been off of it for a month. Her estrogen was through the roof. Um, and I, her body does not, we ran a Dutch test. She does not detox estrogen like at all. And so she's been on the pill and she was having all these horrible symptoms. She, she'd been on it for three years and her doctor kept being like, oh, just stay on it. It's going to get better. And she's like, I really don't feel good. And she's getting these giant, massive clots and periods were super heavy. And she gained a ton of weight and her breasts were tender all the time. She had all the classic estrogen dominant symptoms. Um, but, and it's, I think we're on month three of, she also was super constipated. So she was not moving things. So we, we got her, we got her bowels moving and now we're kind of starting to layer in some other, you know, things that actually speed up the phase two detoxification of the liver. Um, she also had an MTHFR mutation, which, and oftentimes if you've got a couple of those mutations, it can be harder for you to detox. So, um, I don't know if you want me to go into that, but MTHFR, if you're, you know, if you have a mutation in that, your body has a hard time processing folate. You don't methylate folate. So folate can't get taken up properly into the detoxification pathways. And we see a lot of problems with, you can have a lot of issues if you have MTHFR mutations. Um, but I typically like to dose magnesium really high, B5 and B6 really high. Those are my favorite things to use to kind of get the methylation pathways going. Sometimes we'll give a little bit of methylated folate or methylated B12. Um, but that can be helpful as well if there's some estrogen dominance type things going on. Great. Yeah. It seems that methylation has its tendrils in so many different aspects of our physiology. Yes. So it's really yes, it yeah, important to know about. Um, uh, if I know myself, like we use the Dutch test quite regularly in our clinic as well. And especially for folks who are, you know, say, um, you know, menopausal or, or maybe, you know, perimenopausal, we'll see like, oh, there's like, you know, low DHEA, low progesterone. So like we've kind of talked about, okay, there's too much estrogen. Let's help with detoxifying that. But are there, um, uh, any non-pharmaceutical um, options that you found to be helpful um, that kind of on a fairly regular basis will like, you know, boost progesterone, boost DHEA, kind of like boost up some of those hormones or, or estrogen for that matter, if there's maybe an estrogen deficiency, um, any yeah. therapies that kind of reliably do that? Well, so if someone's DHEA is low, DHEA, you know, is a direct precursor to cortisol and testosterone and, you know, and so all the hormones have 
kind of similar building blocks. I mean, and again, when we're kind of looking at the root of the root, if DHEA is low, typically we see typically we see low cortisol, not always, but but usually that runs to like an, an adrenal issue. So, you know, we're going to make sure there's no sort of infection, no sort of mold exposure. And we're also going to look at major lifestyle factors. Are they running themselves into the ground? Are they eating enough? Are they exercising too much? Um, are stress levels through the roof and they're not doing any, they're not getting enough relaxation time because your body, your body builds DHEA and cortisol when you're relaxing, right? That's when the body like builds kind of that, you know, you're able to like make more of that. If you're constantly on the go and you're constantly kind of spending your cortisol or your stress hormones, those are going to be low and eventually we'll see a lowering in the sex hormone. So that's, that's kind of like the foundation we have to look at is like, what is the lifestyle? What, what lifestyle factors are maybe contributing to hormones being low? Um, what was the question you asked me? <laughs> Did you uh, want you wanted non pharmaceutical interventions for that? Uh, yeah, to boost uh, yeah. DHEA, which I think you kind of touched on that, and then uh, say yeah. progesterone, estrogen. Yeah. So I use um, I actually use DH over the counter DHEA quite a bit if levels of that are low. I find people respond to that really well, and that usually will boost the DHEA, can help cortisol, and can help kind of building some of the other hormones. For progesterone, I really like Vitex. Um, which is an herb that will really, ha- it, it tells the ovaries to start producing more progesterone, but I find, I find it only works if we're also treating the adrenal. So I feel like I do that adrenal and when an adrenal treatment, sometimes that's DHEA. Sometimes I use rhodiola, ashwagandha, other adaptogenic herbs. Sometimes I use a little bit of bovine adrenal, um, uh, cortex. And again, the lifestyle thing is honestly the biggest factor. So if, if, you know, you can take all the supplements, you can take supplements till you're blue in the face and spend thousands of dollars. But if you don't address the reason why you're burnt out, it's, you might get a little bit better, but you're just going to get burnt out again. Um, and I, I experienced that personally. So when I was in my twenties, I was extremely burnt out. I took a bunch of supplements in my twenties. I felt great. I was like, Oh, but I didn't, I didn't really change my lifestyle. I went back to running. I went back to, you know, over-exercising, overdoing, saying yes to everything. And I ended up after med school another adrenal crash. So, so I've learned that, you know, the supplements can be helpful, but really like the lifestyle practices are the things that are going to make you better in the long run and help you stay better. It's uh, an important uh, reminder that the word supplement is very well selected. It's, you know, supplementing your lifestyle. It's not, you know, completely, you know, yes. uh, replacing oh, yeah, things or point. yeah. Yeah, you've got to make some other changes. So I'm big on I, you know, I talk about schedules with my patients. Well, what time are you waking up? What are you doing in the morning? When are you getting that downtime or rest time? And really, again, I like to think of it as like you're either spending your energy or you're earning energy. And when you're doing anything, you're spending energy. And you know, the I kind of use this like metaphor as like cortisol as being like the currency that your body uses to do things. Because cortisol, while it's our stress hormone, it also gives us energy. It's what, you know, it governs our circadian rhythms. It wakes us up in the morning. It also has some major anti-inflammatory properties. And when you're resting and you're in that rest and digest phase, that's when your body can actually make more of that. And that will be helpful for the production of more hormones. But if you're again, doing anything, if you're exercising, if you're, you know, even you and I here just talking on this podcast, we're sitting, but you know, we're talking on a podcast, my underarms are sweating a little bit, you know, like I'm in, I'm in an activated fight flight mode. So, you know, we spend a lot of our days in that fight flight mode and not that it's bad, right? Sometimes it could be healthy, but you have to make sure you're balancing that with enough down and rest time. So one of my favorite recommendations to a patient when they're kind of starting to work with me, if I told them to meditate for 45 minutes, they would never come back. So I'll be like, I would like you to lay down for 10 minutes in the afternoon you can sleep if you want, or you could listen to music or you could read no screens, but you just want to like tell the body that it's okay to calm down. And when you lay down, your blood pressure goes down, your heart rate goes down. The physical body is like, oh, it's it's okay for me to relax. And the more you start practicing that, the more you're teaching your body, it's okay to kind of go into that rest mode in the middle of the day. Because most of us, it's like, we wake up in the morning, we drink our coffee, we get going, and then we stay in go mode until we crash at the end of the day. And then we sleep, which you know, we could probably, most of us can do that, but we're eventually, we're kind of whittling away at that energy store, that cortisol store. Um, So like I use the analogy of, you know, again, if cortisol is your currency, when you sleep or when you rest, that's when you're earning currency. If you're spending more than you're making or earning, eventually you're going to go into debt and your body is kind of like a bank. It will give you lines of credit. It will be like, all right, you drank some caffeine. Sure. I'll, I'll give you a little extra energy or you took an Adderall or you took that you know, adrenal supplement or that, you know, the herb that's kind of, it gives you energy, you know, like some of the supplements can also be, you know, they're not necessarily addressing the root cause. Some of them are, but, um, and so again, your body will kind of let you continue to spend on this line of credit, but eventually just like a bank, your body will be like, Nope, 
no more. And this is usually when I see people that are, you know, their energy is completely flatlined. They end up with like fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue, fatigue syndrome, or some of these complex things. Cause their body literally has, it's like, you have no currency, no money to spend anymore. There's no energy to spend. And we'll see random, you'll get, you know, rashes and joint pain and all these anti-inflammatory or inflammatory processes because cortisol is one of the body's main, it's your body's natural steroid. It's your body's natural prednisone. So if we don't have enough of that, you're going to run into some problems. Anyways, thanks for my rant about that. So so building in relaxation time is probably the number one most important thing you can do if you're struggling with any sort of complex chronic illness, in my opinion. I think that's really good advice. Like I actually haven't heard anybody say like, oh, just like kind of lie down or do nothing. It's like, that's so easy. It's much less daunting than like, oh, easy breathing. Like, yeah. And oftentimes what I find is my patients will start doing that and they're like, oh, it feels really good. And some of them will be like, you know what? I am going to try meditating for 10 minutes and they'll try it out and then they might like it. Meditation is not for everyone, but everyone can lay down for 10 minutes. And my, my, um, My grandmother, she just passed, actually, she lived to be 98. And she would say, she would go take a toes up. She'd be like, oh, I'm going to go take a toes up. And she would do that every afternoon. (laughs) So she would just put her toes up and she would lay down for 10 minutes. And then she'd come back and she'd be refreshed. Uh I think she started doing that when she was in her late 60s. But it's like, if you start doing that in your 30s, you know, it's a good habit to build in. I do it with my kids. I have a 10-year-old and a 7-year-old. And, you know, they don't take naps anymore. But sometimes, like, they really need a little reset. So we'll just go. We'll, like, lay in the bed together. And we'll, sometimes we talk. Or sometimes we just put on some music. And we just lay there. And then we'll get up. And we'll be like, all right, now we're recharged. We can go about our day. That's so it's a fun is- little. If you're listening, I highly recommend trying. it. It's a good little practice. Okay. That's, that's wonderful. Yep. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to use that with patients now and maybe with my own, uh, my own kids, potentially we'll see if I can wrangle them for long enough. Um, so, um, Dr. Kinney, we've, uh, kind of talked about a few things like to help, um, uh, talked about some therapies that have been helpful for, or, uh, supplements or herbs or whatnot that have been helpful for, you know, Lyme and hormone imbalances and things like that. I'm kind of looking at things on the opposite end of the teeter totter. Um, are there any supplements or therapies over your practice career that you tried and they just didn't really pan out the way that you hoped, um, that they would things that were kind of swings and misses? That's a good question. Yes, there are. Am I going to remember them? Because I feel like they. I was like, that didn't work. I'm not going to think about it. Um, touche, touche. Uh, hmm. I feel like glucosamine for joint pain. I do not see that. A lot of people take it, but I've never really seen someone start taking it and seeing a drastic improvement in there. And not that you should take it. It's fine to take. It's not harmful, but I, I don't ever see like clinical improvements in pain levels. That's pain levels. I'm not looking at anything else, but I don't, I don't see sure. symptomatic improvement with that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's definitely been other things I've tried over the years that weren't that effective, but I honestly, I can't remember them right now. I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. Yep. That's, That's a great fine. question. I'm going to think about that now. I'm gonna... <laughs> it's a good, good question. Just, you can spring it on your podcast guests if you want to. Yeah. Give them a yeah. Time. Might, yeah. yeah. Put me on the spot here. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I should have sent them. No, I like it. It's great. Good. Uh, well, another one. Um, um, what are you, uh, in the process of uh, learning about or looking into right now? What's kind of on the, the, uh, the cutting edge of your, your practice, or what are you excited about, uh, in, in medicine right now? Oh, what am I excited about in medicine? I, I feel like there's so much more research coming out about, um, just, well, gut, I feel like gut stuff. I always, I, I wrote my thesis on inflammatory bowel disease and I was always really fascinated by, what happens in the gut, what can go wrong in the gut, because so much of our immune system is in the gut, so much, um, and if the gut's not working properly, so many things can go wrong, right? If we're not, if we're not pooping, we're not getting things out, if, you know, if there's gas production, and I've seen such a rise in SIBO, um, and so I, I feel like the more, there's more testing coming out, I've seen some really interesting, like the spore probiotics that have come out, I guess they've been mm-hmm. around for a little while, but I've seen some good research with that, I just, was at the naturopathic convention and there was a lot of really great research on high doses of butyrate, like really high doses of butyrate in some different form. And I've been using that with some patients and it, it actually, if someone has um, a severe gluten intolerance and they, they consume gluten and you give them this really high dose of butyrate, it actually negates the damage that the gluten would do to the GI tract. And I really like, um, I have a couple of colleagues from med school that are doing, um, uh, fecal transplant stuff, but in capsules, like they're encapsulating and taking, actually I'm interviewing someone on my podcast. I think this, this Friday who started a company that's where she, you know, you can take someone else's flora in a capsule, which is super weird to get your brain around, but it's so effective. Like it's so effective at kind of just resetting your whole gut flora. And 
Um, you know, I really work with when my, with my patients with SIBO or dysbiosis or chronic gut stuff. Usually the root of the root of that is their system is super stressed out. Like, so they're constantly in fight flight. There's not enough blood flow to the digestive tract, which affects the pH. And we have, when we affect the pH in the digestive tract, we're going to get an overgrowth of the bad bugs and not enough growth of the good bugs. So, um, this is something I talk to my patients a lot. I'm like, yeah, we can, we can kill off the, you know, the hydrogen producing bacteria for your SIBO, but probably it's going to come back if we don't figure out what caused you to get SIBO in the first place. And oftentimes that's Lyme or mold. It can be chronic stress stuff can be, um, but those are, I usually see Lyme mold and, you know, chronic external stress happening. That's kind of causing that, you know, SIBO or that overgrowth of hydrogen or methane producing bacteria. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I went on a tangent for that one too. No, no, it's we, the whole idea is to pick but, your brain. Yeah. So this is this yeah. is good. You're putting your brain on display. Appreciate yeah. it. Um, so as far as just the pH piece of things, because I know um, you know when uh, I get stool reports or whatnot, like you know comprehensive stool analyses or whatnot, akin to the GI effects or whatnot, um, they, they'll present on the pH, and I kind of don't really honestly don't really think a whole lot about it. So is it more like acidic pH or alkaline pH is going to lead to more? Well, um, either more one, pH. really, if you think about it. But, it. but typically, if the system's really stressed, we're going to see a more acidic pH. So if you remember back to physiology, when you know the system is relaxed and we've got a lot of blood flow to the stomach and the small intestine, we're going to be making more hydrochloric acid in the stomach. And when we make hydrochloric acid in the stomach, we kick out bicarb into the small intestine. So in our, our body is naturally slightly more alkaline, right? We have a pH of about 7.4. Um, and you know, and the pH of the stomach is around a two. Um, but again, it's, it's when our body is relaxed and we're able to make hydrochloric acid that actually keeps the pH more balanced, you know, when we kick out that bicarb. So most dysbiosis dysbiotic states are when the body is slightly more acidic, um, just because, you know, there's system stress, there's not a lot of blood flow going to the GI tract. If there's no blood flow there, we're not producing hydrochloric acid, which means we're not producing bicarb. So we're going to start to see, and you're never, your body's never going to get so acidic that, you know, but you might go from a 7.4 to a 7.35 or something like it's just a slight, but that slight variation in pH is going to cause massive disruption in the gut flora because the gut flora is very, you know, again, the pH is what determines what grows and what doesn't. And this, I feel like, isn't talked about very much in all the gut stuff I've gone to. I'm like that, I feel like is the, is really the root issue. And this is why diet makes such a big impact on the gut because diet plays a big role in that pH. Um, so, you know, when you drink lemon, anything that helps like the stomach produce more hydrochloric acid is going to help your pH, um, in the small intestine and the rest of the body. Um, and, you know, this is where, you know, a lot of people who take proton pump inhibitors where, you know, they're not, they're blocking that acid production. They're going to start to have digestive, you know, dysbiosis in the small intestine because the rest of their body is going to get slightly more acidic. So I'm not really not a fan of those because they, they cause a lot of problems if you're on them long-term. Um, and this is why like digestive enzymes are so effective because they kind of help tell the body to send more blood flow to the, to the system. Um, but, you know, if we're going to go to like simple lifestyle life packs, one of the best things you can do to help the pH in your small intestine is breathing, belly breathing. So putting one hand on the belly, one hand on the chest, take a really deep breath, make a pregnant belly, like as pregnant as you can get your belly. And that's telling the body to send blood flow and send oxygen to that digestive tract, which will then kick up hydrochloric acid production and kick up bicarb production. So you can start to kind of unwind that bad pH or that acidic pH just by a simple practice of breathing, which is so cool. So on so many levels, that breathing. Yes. Yep. It's amazing stuff. Um, so uh, Dr. Kenny, just as we're kind of starting to get um, close to our time here, um, I'm just wondering if there are any other um, kind of notable take-home messages or interesting uh, topics or things that you'd like to leave um, listeners with that we haven't uh, got into so far. Yeah. So I think one thing we haven't really talked about is, is mindset. And I'm, I'm really big on my patients of, you know, talking about what's your current mindset? Like what's, what's your inner dialogue, go, you know, doing? Um, Cause if you're constantly telling yourself negative things about your body, one, that's a stress signal that will cause your body to go into fight flight. Nobody likes to have negative things told to them. You know, if someone else says something negative about you, that will stress you out. So if you're constantly like, oh, my body doesn't work or I'm fat or I'm whatever the negative self-talk is, that's definitely something that needs to be addressed, particularly when there's complex chronic things going on. I find that that is a piece that again, is often underlooked. So that, that the mindset piece is definitely something that needs to be discussed. You know, and if you've been told by, you know, if you were diagnosed with something and you've been told by a conventional doc, hey, you're never going to get better. You're going to have this disease. Of course, the mindset's going to be a little, it's going to be a little tough. So this is why it's great to work with a naturopath or a functional medicine doc, because most of us will be like, Hey, you actually can get better from this. There's hope. We're going to, we're going to work on this. Um, 
And I think just having that subtle shift of, you know, more of a positive mind shift can be extremely game changing. Um, so that's one piece that I always address in my practice. And then the other piece is the emotional piece, like what's going on in the emotional realm for you. You know, if there's stuff that hasn't been expressed or stuff that's not, um, that you haven't talked about, or if any emotion is kind of trapped in your system and it's not moving, just like what we were talking about earlier, if your bowels aren't moving or kidneys aren't moving fluid, when stuff stays stuck, it's not good. But if you have an emotion that's stuck in your system, like if you're really angry at, I don't know, your partner, your kid, and you haven't expressed it, it will start to manifest as a physical symptom. Or if you have a lot of grief, or if you have a lot of guilt, whatever, whatever emotion it is that you're kind of like, I don't want to deal with that, that can start to have an impact on the physical body. And sometimes people don't want to hear that. I sometimes tell people that and they're like, this does not have to do with mine. I'm like, you weren't quite ready for that. But I will tell you that when there's something complex and chronic, it is always a piece of it. It's, it definitely is not going to be the whole thing. There's, you know, there's usually when you're talking, looking at complex chronic illness, there's multiple factors that we have to address, but that and mindset are definitely a big piece. And I think those pieces are often underlooked. You're not going to find that on a functional lab test, right? That's something that you're going to have to, you're going to have to talk to your practice. Your practitioner is going to have to ask you about that. And so um, it's, and, and, and if that's something that you figure out, okay, this might actually have a big piece or be a big piece of what's going on with my health. It's, good for you to find some way to get that moving. And there are so, again, there's so many tools and so many things. There's sound therapy, there's Reiki, there's craniosacral therapy, there's all kinds of really cool healing modalities that are available. And it's really important that you find one that you like and that you're going to do. And that can be really helpful to kind of get those things moving. Um, for folks who have listened to other uh, episodes of this podcast, um, you re recall that uh, this is something that's brought up by quite a few of my guests. So the folks who are like Dr. Kinney, who are steeped in this complex chronic illness world, whether we <laughs> sought it out ourselves or it found us, um, it's uh, yeah something that a lot of my other guests have mentioned. And I've definitely seen that with my own patients as well. And, and like paraphrasing what you said, like there's other stuff too. Like it's not like, you know, oh, my, you know, um, sort of a deep seated emotion, you know, is somehow manifested a Borrelia spirochete in my body or something like that. Like, you know, but just yeah, no. predisposition, but it will, it will affect your immune system. It will affect, and, and, and usually like, again, if there's an emotion that's trapped in the body, I like to, to differentiate, there's two major buckets of stressors that I talk about. There's external stress, which might be the pandemic or a job or your child or work or, um, and those are things sometimes we can control, sometimes we can't, but then there's internal stressors, which we talked about some of them, mold and infection, you know, nutrient deficiency, but this emotional piece or the mindset piece, these can be internal stressors if they're not dealt with and they're not kind of going in the right direction. And so again, they'll put the body, it'll keep it more in fight flight, which can cause, you know, a lot of different issues. So, cause I sometimes will get patients to come and they're like, yeah, my life is great. I have a great job. My kids are great. My relationship great. I have enough money. Like everything in my external was great, but I'm, they're presenting to me like someone who's so stressed out. And granted, sometimes that might be an infection or a mold exposure, but sometimes that could be they're you know, they're holding on to something from their childhood or, um, or like I said, they've got really negative self-talk or, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. But yeah, yeah, it's, I know at a conference I went to, I think it was the, the forum for integrative medicine conference from several years ago. Uh, one of the, uh, speakers there, Sandeep Gupta, um, no relationship to, uh, Ashok Gupta of the Gupta program, different, different Dr. Gupta. Um, but, uh, he was talking about um, adverse childhood events and just how they've done studies showing that folks where they have a history of adverse childhood events. And if you're not familiar with that listeners, um, like this doesn't have to be like, Oh, I was, you know, abandoned at two and was raised by, you know, people on the railroad or something like that. Like it can be just like, I didn't have enough attention from, you know, my parents or like, you know, they didn't get enough hugs or whatever it happened to be. Like, it doesn't have to be like, you know, major, major catastrophic trauma. These kind of, um, other, uh, anyways, it could be a varying degrees of trauma. Um, to my understanding, they've done studies looking at folks um, where they have, you know, report, you know, higher numbers on the adverse childhood, childhood event scales and seeing like, oh, they have higher levels of inflammatory markers in their body. They have a, um, you know, more, uh, uh, greater issues with their adrenal gland physiology. Um, they have more tendency towards immune system dysfunction. And, you know, just those are all the things where we see, oh, what do people with Lyme disease, like chronic Lyme and mold illness, et cetera, have like, it's all these predispositions as well. So it's kind of setting that stage from the history of either, you know, stored trauma or, you know, different things that have uh, stored emotions or what have you can really have like, you know, we have laboratory evidence that it does affect our physiology. It can be a really big, uh, it can be a piece of the puzzle, whether it's a huge piece or a minor piece, you know, it's going to be more case specific, but 
I appreciate you bringing this up, Dr. Kinney, because it's super, super important. Um, yeah. Just we're winding down to our last few minutes here. Um, would you be able to just give uh, listeners um, some, or let listeners know rather how they can uh, find you on social media, if they want sure. to, do you, do you work with folks uh, long distance, if they want to yeah. work with you, um, any online offerings that you have, anything you could share, and I'll put all the links in the show notes if uh, anything you mentioned. Awesome. So I mostly hang out on Instagram. I'm at Dr. Kinney, so D-R-K-I-N-N-E-Y. Um, I'm on Facebook too. And um, my website is DrAaronKinney.com. We have an adrenal freebie. It's like, you know, guide to adrenal fatigue, kind of addressing that, which just kind of scratches the surface of kind of some of the stuff that we've talked about today. It's mostly a lot of really like easy lifestyle hacks that you can put into your into your life that help kind of calm your nervous system down, which again, you know, is helpful for all, all things we've been talking about today. Um and yeah, and I work with people all over the country and virtually, or I, again, I'm in Annapolis, Maryland, but we, we see people all over the place. So, um, and yeah. are they, are folks able to work with you like, uh, via telemedicine or do they have to come in person or how does no, that work? Yeah, so we do, we do telemedicine, we do virtual consults. Um, and it's myself, we have a nurse practitioner, we have a health coach and we have another ND that'll be joining the practice in a couple months. And, um, so yeah, it's, it's a good, I, I love this medicine. Like I, I love it. I don't. I'm so grateful to be in this role. And I, I really love teaching. Oh, you can also, I have a show called the Dr. Kinney show. If you want to check that out and listen to it, I get a lot of different, different healing modality, people coming on the show, MDs, NDs, um, sound healers. I, you know, kind of all over the, and it's, it's so cool. I love, I love hearing people's stories on how they got into whatever they're into. And cause it's usually, they went through a personal, just, you know, personal journey and now they're helping always. others. Almost yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Almost always. I, I think I've yet to have a guest on my show that didn't have some like radical healing journey that kind of either like caused a career change or they're like, this is what I want to do, which again, it's, I don't know, it's super cool. So yep. yeah. Wonderful. Great. Well, um, yeah, I will put the links to all of those um, resources in the show notes, or if you're watching this on YouTube, um, I'll put that in the comment section below the video. Um, Dr. Kenny, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me today. It was a great chat and I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks so much. <clears throat> Pardon me. Thanks so much, everyone uh, listening to this or watching this episode of the Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast. Uh, thanks for your attention and we'll uh, see you in the next episode.